Hey Noir fans, Jason here from Speakeasy Noir Cast. So when Carly and I started looking for solutions for our podcast, we discovered there were way too many options available. We almost gave up looking for the right fit and came close to forking over a bunch of money for one size fits all type of solution. Then I stumbled upon Anchor FM. Not only is this amazing service free, but we can record and edit our podcast directly from Anchor FM or even on our phone when we're on the go. That alone saves us a ton of money and time. But there are several other major benefits to using Anchor FM that makes it the perfect fit for us. Anchor has a built-in solution for distributing our podcast to all the major outlets, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and just about anything else you can think of. You no longer have to submit your RSS feed to every single service in existence just to get your episode to your fans. And talking about money again, like I said, Anchor is absolutely free. And Anchor FM will even help you to make some cold hard cash right from the very beginning. Anchor FM has a unique advertising platform that doesn't require a minimum listenership. So right out the gate, you can start making some money. So let's put it in perspective. Anchor FM is free. Everything you need to make a podcast in one place, instant distribution, and they'll help you make some money right from the start. So if you've been struggling to find the perfect platform for your podcast, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started after you finish this episode, of course. Here we go. Wait, I think you need to introduce. I think you need to open the show occasionally. Hey. I mean, well, occasionally, but I mean, is this the occasion to? I think so. I'll open the show for Memento. How's that? Okay. All right. We can do yeah. that. All right. So here we are again. Episode four. Is this oh. episode four? I can't yeah. remember. We're, we're no, only, we're five. still in the Five. No, we're still in the single digits, and I can't even remember what episode we're on now. It's episode four. It's definitely four, right? If you say so. I say so. Okay, then it's four. <laughs> Our Lord and Master has spoken. I- I'm terrible with math. Um, well, that's reassuring, considering you deep with the finances. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Not by choice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Not I because tried. Because there is no other choice. <laughs> So before we get started in introducing what our next movie is, which I think I already spoiled it last week. Yep. Um, but we're going to start out by letting you all know what our drink of the week is. Just come on into the speakeasy, sit down, and we're going to make you a gin Ricky. Does... uh. Do you know what that is, Carly? Have you ever heard of a gin, Ricky? No idea. Okay. So you're going to like this one because I know you love gin, all right? I do. All right. So a gin, Ricky, is gin, half of a lime, and your favorite club soda. Oh, God. So it's a gin and <laughs> like, it's like, oh, it's like a gin and tonic. It's a gin and tonic, basically, with a, with some lime. All right. So it's a posh gin and tonic. I guess. I'm not sure what that means. Does that mean? Ups- yeah. So it, basically, if you go into a pub in England, you have a gin and tonic. If you have lime in it, I mean, that is a stand up establishment. So you have oh, lime. Because limes are expensive, lime, right? Is they that freaking a- are. <laughs> if you've got fresh lime on the back of the bar that's not moldy, I mean, that is a top class place. My goodness. That takes it from like 450 to like eight pounds. Wow. Yeah. Um. So... I'm assuming that this is kind of a 50-50, 50% gin, 50% tonic, or club soda. I mean, I'd do it 60-40, but... Sure. I mean, yeah. that... 60 you know. gin, 40, whatever else. And they say that um, you got to pay attention to the color of it. If there, if it's too um, if it's too green or cloudy, there's too much lime in the drink. Oh. Um, and I'm not... I'm, I really don't like lemon or lime. Um, the only time that I drink that is if I'm drinking uh, like a... Um, Corona beer or something like that I'll put lime in it um, But other than that I don't really care for Why it do you put lime in that? I don't know It complements it pretty well I, I, You know whenever you order it It's served with it Yeah um, And maybe I, I just I'm got pre- used to it Okay I'm pretty sure I could be completely incorrect However I remember hearing this story A lot from my bar days Apparently the only reason Why there's lime in it Is because it keeps the flies away when it's served in hot country. So it actually doesn't do anything to the drink except keep flies away. That's interesting. It does, though. Yeah. I mean, because you can definitely taste it. Um, and I, I feel like it does complement it. Like, I, I like it. And it's the only thing that I really like lime or lemon in. Um, but uh, I, I, I can't stand lemon or lime in anything else. Um, you are so strange. I know. I am. Yeah. 
Um, but I mean, you know, this is a noir podcast and I'm astonished at the number of highballs in noir films <laughs> or, or the use of club soda, yeah. uh, which appears to be in every single one. It's either they're drinking straight or they're mixing it with club soda. Um, so how does that make you feel? <laughs> no, <laughs> over in Britain, um, you know, it's it's frowned upon, I guess. I mean, is it just mixed drinks in general that you guys frown upon or it's sort of not the thing or is it just club soda in general? It's probably mink, mixed drinks in general because we are a, we are a nation of um, solid alcoholics straight, and binge drinkers. Straight drinkers. So it's like anything else is just watering it down. We need to get to the punchline. Take the water out. <laughs> take the coke out. Take the lemonade out. What are you doing with that? You, you guys don't man. even have regular glasses. It's either you got a beer glass or you got shot glasses. It's just yeah, pretty much, or a beer glass with a little with... chaser. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, because I do mix like my my drink of choice is bourbon and coke, um, and I, I I enjoy that. But I mean, it's the thing that I find is that most places just don't mix it properly. Like the consistency, like there's either too much bourbon or too much Coke. So it's either, you know, too, uh, too strong or, you know, just too sugary. So shall I tell you my confession, which is a really disgusting drink to 99% of the population that I absolutely love. Sure. But can't afford to drink because I'm poor. Confession time. I think we need like confession a sound effect for, for confession time because we I seem think, to have those every week. <laughs> I think we do. Okay. So my my dirty confession drink is uh, Tia Maria and orange juice. What is this? What is Tia Maria? Do you have Tia Maria? No, I it's have like a no idea. liqueur. Um. So so what is it though? Like okay. So it's a liqueur. But what what uh, what does it taste like? Like what does it look okay, well, like? With Coke, <laughs> it like... kind of. It's black. With Coke, it kind of tastes like coffee. But if you put it with fresh orange juice and you have a double, it tastes like Terry's chocolate orange, which is potentially something that you weirdos don't have. But in, in the UK, we have Terry's chocolate orange, which is um, uh, like, like basically a chocolate that's segmented into like an orange. And he's amazing. Interesting. And okay. Tia Maria and orange juice as a double tastes like Terry's chocolate orange. And it is the best thing ever. But people, when you order it, they look at you like, what, what the hell are you doing in there? Get uh, out. What's it called again? Tea what? Tea at Maria. Tea at Maria? Tia. Tia, Tia. like the name Tia Maria. <laughs> Tia Maria. Yeah. I guess I don't know how to spell it. Tia, T -I -A. Tia Maria. Yeah. I'm trying to look this up, folks. Okay, so we do have this. It's originally in Jamaica. Using Jamaican coffee beans, now made in Italy. Interesting. It's amazing. Jamaican rum, vanilla, and sugar blended into an alcoholic content. Oh, so this is... Okay, so actually this might be pretty good. It's amazing. All right, so you use this and you add what again? Orange? Fresh. Yeah, fresh orange juice. And that's it? It, l it looks disgusting it looks like somebody is thrown back up in a glass genuinely huh. it looks horrendous but it tastes amazing is there an is there a name for this particular drink i it's, not that i'm aware of because i think you make I this might, up <laughs> i think i might be the only person on the planet that drinks it um but yeah oh god you gotta try it it's the best Oh, no, you're not, actually. And and did you say you add coffee to it, or this has notes of coffee in it already? No, it when you just have it with Coke, it tastes like coffee. It's like it has a coffee taste to it. Mm. Tea Maria drink secrets. Oh my goodness. We're gonna have to add we're gonna have to make this the drink of the, the week uh, on another episode. Um, now that you've ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> by, by explaining to an American what it is. Sorry. Um, it's all your fault. Okay. Now I'll take that. Yeah. All right. Okay. I could so start a revolution of this new drink. Don't do that. British revolutions are unneeded. Not my day. <laughs> okay. So getting back to the gin, Ricky. All right. <laughs> so gin, Ricky is the capital's official cocktail of DC. All right. Okay. Um, 
it says that in 1883, a Civil War colonel turned Washington lobbyist invented the drink at a local dive bar. Shoemakers. Where the regular crowd was mostly uh, journalists and politicians. And his name was not surprisingly Joe Rickey. And that's where the name comes from. All right. So this is a Civil War colonel named Joe Rickey, who invented the drink, the Gen Rickey, at a dive bar called The Shoemakers in Washington, D.C. in 1883. Nice. Well done, you. Um, they say that it can get pretty tart. Um, and I guess back in the day, that was, you know, just the way it was done. So um, currently, uh, if you order it, usually they'll add some simple syrup. Uh, to sweeten it up a bit. Um, especially if, I guess, if you're adding that, uh, that lime to it as well. Um, it definitely would get a little tart. Um, and like I said, you know, watch out for the color. Uh, if it's too green or cloudy, they've put too much lime in it. So I, it doesn't specify the consistency if it's, you know, but I, I assume most drinks that way are kind of a 50, 50. Um, and you know, case of Carly, it'd be a, a 60, 10. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like a 90-10. Yeah, 90-10. <laughs> Told you I'm bad at math. <laughs> Never pour me a drink. <laughs> so there it is, guys. Hopefully uh, you can, you know, you had some time to make your gin Ricky and uh, drink along with us. Um, and it's time to kick back and uh, listen to uh, us talk about the movie of the week, which is, Carly? Mildred Pierce. Warner Brothers invites you to witness the first scene of a motion picture the world will talk about. Mildred. Mildred. A name gasped in the night. The one last word of a dying man. But one word that tells a thousand stories of a woman who left her mark on every man she met. Mildred had more to offer a man in a glance than most women give in a lifetime. Mildred knew what she wanted. It wasn't too particular how she got it. Mildred? Loving her was like shaking hands with a devil. It's Joan Crawford in her most daringly different portrayal, Mildred Pierce. The intimate affairs of a woman who refused to live by the rules. Well, I, uh, I wonder why you brought me here tonight. I mean, all of a sudden, boom. Husband gone, soft lights, quiet room, opportunity. She tried to kiss off a crime. You make me feel I don't know, warm. And wanted. She bought a love she could never own. <laughs> How long has this been going on? Monty is going to divorce you and marry me. And there's nothing you can do about it. You think because you've made a little money, you can get yourself a new hair doing some expensive clothes and turn yourself into a lady. But you can't. Because you'll never be anything but a common... The outspoken story of an indiscreet woman. Joan Crawford. Jack Carson. Zachary Scott. And Mildred Pierce. A different kind of story from the pace-setting studios of Warner Brothers. Who, which of I've I saw somebody post on a, a film noir uh, Facebook page. I had never heard of the movie. I take that back. I had seen Criterion uh, Collection release the movie, and I, I had seen like that sitting on the shelves in the stores. But it looked like a drama, um, opposed to like a noir film. And um, then I saw somebody post about it into a Facebook page, and it had a GIF or a video of. Uh, this amazing slap that happens in the movie, um, which I saw and was just like, whoa, I have to, I have to check this out. So here we are. 
with Mildred Pierce. All right, Carly, can you give us mm-hmm. your infamous synopsis of Mildred Pierce? <laughs> okay. I loved you your ready? last one so much. <laughs> so, Thank you. Yeah, your your um your your little copy for uh, Thirty Nine Steps was amazing. So I think we no, need I to continue this tradition. I don't think I can tradition. top that. I don't think I can top that. I mean, I you don't I have to, to do... top it. You just have to be just as good. <laughs> I mean, I tried to. It's basically my synopsis in a nutshell, which is uh, possibly not relevant, but basically I have described Mildred Pierce as an impressively driven woman shows us the consequences of spoiling your bratty children. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're really great at making these concise synopsis. That's Why, exa- thank you. That's exactly the movie. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I get to the root of the movie. Yes. Yeah. You really do. I think that's that's uh, you know probably the, your brilliance as a writer. <laughs> Thank all my uh, talent is a sarcastic git. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Mildred Pierce is a 1945 film. It's directed by Michael Curtis. It, star- it stars um, Joan Crawford, um, who won an Academy Award for this film. Not surprising. Right. She's she's amazing in it. She's great. Yeah. Um, and apparently it was sort of her comeback um, after she left uh, Metro Goldwyn or, or lost her contract or more mutually agreed to, you know, separate, whatever it might have been, the drama of the time. Um, but, yeah, um, rightfully so. She won an Academy Award for this film. Um, it also stars Jack Carson and Zachary Scott um, and featuring Eve Arden and Anne Blythe and Bruce Bennett. Uh, it was based on a novel by James Cain, um, which apparently there are some significant differences between the film and the book, but while still keeping with the ideology of the story. Um and I was I was most surprised to find out that they added the murder. Um, did you did you happen to research any of that and and find out that they had that the murder didn't exist in the book? Yeah, I saw that, and I was I'm going to have to read the book because I was kind of struggling with how that would work. Because I, I don't know. But then again, I suppose the murder's quite... It's a long film. Um, and the murder's kind of... I guess you could say it's insignificant. You could do a different film with it without the murder. Yeah, um, yeah. It's def- I'm going to have to read the, the book. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't... You're right. You, you could probably take out the beginning and the end and it's the movie holds its own. Um, just fine. However... And I guess it speaks to that as well, what I'm about to say is that, you know, those, it, it almost feels like two different films to me. Um, the the setup uh, with the murder, I mean, everything that, that deals with the the story of the murder is dark and gloomy and noirish and it's shot beautifully. Um, and And when you get into the drama of the film, which is essentially flashbacks, it's shot you know high key uh you know it's just a it feels like a different movie Mm. um and that kind of bothered me because as i was watching the opening sequence the cinematography was so fantastic i was like wow i can't wait to see gorgeous it's so gorgeous isn't it it's just a gorgeous film to look at yeah um I, i was like i really hope that you know i'm i'm excited to get into the rest of this but then when i would cut into the flashbacks not that it wasn't competent, but they really allowed the actors to carry the film up over the cinematography in those in those scenes. Um, as to where the murder sequences were all carried by the mood and the style, um, which I guess makes sense, but it really felt inconsistent uh, with with the flashback stuff. So that that was my only gripe of the entire movie, and and I liked both parts of it. It wasn't that I disliked them. It just felt like two different, maybe even two different cinematographers or two different directors or something like that. Um, Just the consistency wasn't there between the two pieces. 
Um, did you feel that at all? Like when, when you watched, cause it, I, to me, it just felt like it was a hard left turn once we got into the flashback. Yeah, no, I can see where you're coming from. I, um, I'll be honest when I saw, you know, Oh God, it's a melodrama noir. I thought, Oh God, here we go. Right. But actually I was pleasantly surprised. And I think that's because of the opening sort of scenes you know, where he's running around the house trying to escape the spiral staircase, the shadows, like all of that was so atmospheric. And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be great. And then in the police station, um, introducing the different characters. And then when it went into the flashbacks, I think I was kind of already suckered in by that point. Mm -hmm. So I was quite happy to sort of have the establishing, oh, this is where it all started. And, um, I think because the opening was so well done that I was quite happy to put that to the side and not be as bothered about it as perhaps you would be when you were watching it. Yeah, no, and I I, I fully agree with that. Um, and it's not till after finishing the movie that that sort of popped into my head, like that kind of bothered me. But I mm. agree with you that that sort of setup and the tonality of it did suck me in as well. Um, and I think that's what, probably helped the movie quite a bit um, for the drama that was about to unfold. <clears throat> and I think that's also what really made it a noir film. Cause without that, this is really a, just a drama film. Like the noir aspects of it are not really, I mean, they are a little bit, but nowhere near as much in terms of style and um, you know, uh, atmosphere. Yeah. Um, it, it really just plays out as pretty much a drama. So, hey, Carl, let's take a break real quick and talk to our listeners about our sponsors. All right, guys, we're back and we're going to keep talking about this film. I mentioned earlier, Joan Crawford is absolutely amazing in this film. Um, I thought she was just fantastic and I couldn't take my eyes off her. Um, she was amazing and do you know what was actually interesting which is i probably i'll probably be corrected at some point but when i was watching it another reason why i was kind of hooked into the drama bit was because uh the opening the war sort of stuff the shadows uh the only person that didn't have like a looming shadow over her was her character oh interesting i didn't catch that. which then continued into <clears throat> the drama and then i started to notice that certain people did I was like, oh, okay, so I can, oh, okay. It, I don't know, just something sort of like that kind of made me play along with the whole melodrama middle. Huh, interesting. I didn't catch that at all. Yeah, because I, I, I was waiting to see if she did. I think she might have then, when it got into the tail end of it, she then, there was a shot where she had like a really sinister shadow like we'd seen previously for other characters. I was like, oh, maybe we'll get into something here. Yeah, the only point that I noticed it, I think, was in the beginning when she sits down in the police station. There's like a shot that sort of pushes into her and she's draped in shadows. And I think that was because they were trying to imply that she was the murderer. Uh, but it was just the one shot and that was it um, that I recall that that happening. So, yeah, I mean, that's a great point that I didn't I didn't really catch. Um, throughout it what did you think of her first husband the the guy that's about to get you know penned for this murder okay um i don't <laughs> i don't know because i was very confused because when they announced that they were getting divorced and then mm. he was like i'm going you're gonna have to raise him on your own i thought that he was gonna be gone right forever because that's kind of how it was made out like oh that's it we're gonna have to survive on our own he's gone forever and then he just like randomly started popping up again. Oh, I'm taking the kids for a weekend. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were gone, pal. Yeah, and I thought that was pretty interesting, like how they did that because they they made him. At first, they make you not dislike him because he's you know for whatever reason is not happy in the marriage, and they he's got a side check, you know. However, he was correct in what he was saying about the children. Yes. And her assessment of dealing with the children, he was 100% right. Absolutely, yeah. And he remained in their life and did all the things that he's supposed to do as a, you know, part-time dad sort of thing. Um, yeah. So he was really a good guy in the end. He, they, I think they, they did a great job setting him up as potentially being the bad guy. 
um, which might be, you know, the whole reason behind it. Because when you see these movies, you're just seeing a snippet into the drama. You know, when people are, are married or, you know, have these lives that it's always a gradual progression of little things that add up into big things. Do you know who I didn't like? Who didn't you like? Are you Wally. scaring me now? Who? Wally. Wally, 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 Wally. Who's Wally? The guy that's always lingering around in the background. Oh, Wally, yeah, yeah. I'm... He's like a dog on heat. Yeah, and that, well, you what know. What is wrong with him? Uh, you know, I, I think it was, I think part okay. of it has to do with the actor himself and the other things that he's portrayed. I, I read a little bit about him and he was generally used as comic relief, which in the film, his attitude towards her, which is, I mean, obviously he likes her, but he's not like obsessed with her in sort of a creepy way. He's just sort of a player kind of obsessed with her. And it makes it sort of comical, even though she's got her drama going on. So she doesn't really pay attention to it other than an annoyance. I mean, I did halfway through the film. I started to think, you fool. He was actually the nicest guy out of all of them. Well, and, then I, and then I flipped back around and said, no, I don't like you again. <laughs> well, he kind of he was because he helped every... See, he, the thing he helped with, with everything. Yeah. The thing with him, though, is he had personal motives. like. He he didn't compromise his belief system for anything. Yeah. Even though he helped her out, he's going to get something out of it as well. You know, or even when it came to the point where the husband was trying to sell off the company and Wally was like, well, I have to, too, or I'm going to get screwed. And I'm sorry if that screws you, but I have myself to think of as well. Um, so it's like there's a there's some Adam, you know, admirable qualities to him, but he's also you know, for himself. Um, and I think that's okay for a character, but I, I think that that's part of the reason why when she tries to set him up, that that makes him the perfect patsy for it. Yeah. Because we see those selfish qualities of him. And, and even though he's a good guy through the movie and helps her out and, you know, helps other people out, helps his daughter out, things like that. Um, He's still that sort of seedy underbelly sort of walking on the right side of things, but still for himself. And I, I think that gave her cause to, you know, out of all the people in her life. Um, he would be the one dependent on because I do, I do think, though, that he has the best line in a film that I've heard for a long time. Oh, what's this? something about the sound of my own voice that fascinates oh. me. I saw <laughs> yes. when he said that, I was like, aha, interest Pete. <laughs> exactly. That, that, that shows you his, his personal, like, you know, selfishness, you know, which is I great. That was great line. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Cause it, I mean, they set his character very well um, for that. In my opinion, he's probably one of the most realistic characters because that is everybody knows mm -hmm. that guy. Right. Yep. He's he's kind of the um, you know, the Han Solo character, you know? Selfish, yeah, and even but... in the end, he doesn't want to, like, give anything. Even though she's tried to pin a murder on him, he's still, like, hesitant to tell the police mm -hmm. what actually happened. Yeah, he's he's not, like, trying to out her. He's just trying to make sure that he doesn't get pinned for the murder. Because, I mean, it's pretty obvious, I would think, to him that she killed the guy. Mm -hmm. You know, even though she didn't in the end, but uh, I would assume going through his head, she killed she him and it. tried to pin it on him. But he likes her and maybe he's not trying to, you know, go to jail at the same time. And he probably you know. thinks good on her. Maybe she'll come marry me. Yeah. When she gets I, out of jail. That's, <laughs> yeah, that might be possible. Yeah. I mean, that 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 sounds reasonable with his uh, train of thought. Yeah. But I do. agree. I, I liked him. I thought he was a great character. Um, he was fun. Uh, his, um, his brand of, of comic relief was subtle enough that it didn't, um, feel out of place. Cause a lot of movies, especially nowadays, they throw in that, um, levity, you know, because they feel like, oh, this is too dark. You know, you need to laugh occasionally, but they do it too over the top. And I don't think he was over the top at all. I think it was perfectly placed in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. I was also... 
um, impressed with um, the daughter. Oh, I hated her. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I also did. Um, but I mean, she obviously played a good part and she right. did it well because if I could have jumped in the TV and bitch slapped her, I would have. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and um, that was uh, Anne Blythe, correct? That was her I name? Think so. Yeah. I liked the power battle in slaps. That was great. The first slap was like, I'm in charge. The second slap was like, I'm in charge. Well, yeah. And, and you know, it was so like she knocked her on her ass. <laughs> she did. One. She fucking did. <laughs> like, you're tearing up my check, you bitch. <laughs> like, wow. And, and that was the, the little shot that I had seen on, online somewhere that got me interested in this movie because it looked so unplanned. Um, as I'm watching the movie, it feels like it's totally scripted. But seeing that shot out of context, like it felt like, it, wow, like she really knocked her down. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if there was some sort of like conflict between Joan Crawford and her or something. I mean, she was a young girl, um, but she played that so well and so bitchy and so, you know, I don't know. It manipulative. Just, yeah, manipulative. Absolutely. And they say that the character is way worse in the book. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, whoa, <laughs> if it got any worse than that, <laughs> Mildred is just fucked up in the head, too, because, I mean, who's going to deal with that? How could you not see what you're doing? You know, I understand wanting the best for your kids, but that's you're you're creating a monster. She's Dr. Frankenstein, you know. No, I think that's what she realized in the end, though, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. But even in the end. She's like, don't take my daughter away. I'll, I'll take the rap. You know, yeah. even in the end, she did not break. She might have realized it, but she did not break. She's like, you know, my daughter goes free. And which this reminded me a lot of your um, script that you wrote, um, Right and Wrong. Yeah, I was thinking that towards the end. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, how you, had you seen Mildred Pierce before? I think you said you had seen it a really long time ago. Yeah, I see it a long time ago. Mm -hmm. You're talking like conflict years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah is it, it reminded me a lot of the, um, you know, of, of the character, the lead character of your, um, of your story, Right and Wrong, where she is trying to cover and will take the rap for her daughter. And for our listeners, um, you can check out that story uh, in our book that we released, The Dark Side of Acting Up, uh, which is a book of plays um, that, you know, covers a lot of different types of stories. Um, it's it, They're all very dark and some are noirish and some of them are just, uh, just... Some of them are just plain twisted. Yeah, just twisted. Um, but you can find it on Amazon. You can get it on... Uh, on Kindle, a digital version or, or a paperback. <clears throat> and it's got some fantastic artwork uh, from a man named Ian Stopforth. Ian. Uh, Ian. Sorry, Ian. I, I'm Ian. You know, American, whatever. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ian. 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 Sorry. Sorry, Ian, for calling you Ian. Um, but he's a great artist. He's just fantastic. He's done a lot of work for us. Um, and every story is opened with a, a piece of art that he's done, uh, to sort of re reflect the story. Um, so pick it up if you can. It's great. Um, so Mildred Pierce, uh, also became a miniseries in 2011. Have you seen that? Yes. With Kate Winslet and you, Guy Pearce. You've seen it? Of, of course, course Guy have. Pierce. Jesus. Of course, I've seen it. <laughs> I haven't. I didn't even. I didn't know it existed. I had no no idea Mildred Pierce existed, other than I guess seeing the Criterion Blu-ray or DVD in the stores, and I didn't even know what it was at the time. But it's a great movie. I would definitely watch it again, though. And I, I now want to watch the miniseries. The miniseries apparently follows the novel quite a bit, opposed to the movie. Um, yeah. so if you've seen the miniseries, like, you, you know, there's no murder. There's, you know, they, they have different actresses portraying, uh, the daughter. 
because uh, I guess the original novel takes place over the nine years as to where the film um, takes place over the course of four years. So how did you feel about the miniseries? I know we're not here to talk about the miniseries, but in terms of like the differences, did you enjoy it as much or more? Or what did you um, think of Well, that? it's different because I watched the miniseries a long time ago. Um, having shockingly never watched the original film for a while. So mm -hmm. I didn't, it was that long ago that I didn't really click. Oh, I didn't thought, connect it, yeah. Yeah, I genuinely thought um, until I started doing research that they were two completely separate things. Right. Because they are quite different. Um, and I think uh, the only problem that I had with this film was that it was a little bit long. Yeah. Which okay. is why I think the miniseries works a little bit better because obviously you've got longer to tell the story you can get in the ins and outs of the characters. It's not as, even though it's a long film, it's still quite rushed for the content. Right. Like there's so much that you can dive into and so many extra things that you can have. Um, so I did appreciate that sort of length in the miniseries. Yeah. And I could totally understand that. I mean, after reading um, about the book and, you know, what's sort of different between the film and the book, I can totally see how a miniseries would work much better, especially over the course of the time span that the book takes place. Um, and I understand how they sort of compressed it in the film. And I thought that they did a great job compressing it. Uh, and, and removing characters. I, I didn't feel like there were holes in the film at all. Um, and overall, I think even though that the, um, the style of filming for the murder scenes is tonally different than the rest of the film, I feel like they weaved that into the story effectively. Like I wouldn't have known that that wasn't in the book by watching mm -hmm. the movie. A lot of times when you watch a movie based on a book, like you can tell there's something just off about it something missing or you know they've obviously changed something even if you haven't read the book you know um you can still kind of feel that and i didn't feel that with this movie at all um so that's on my book list now because i want to check it out and also the miniseries um, i'm not a fan of anybody in <laughs> in the miniseries honestly i'm not a, you know um but i will not even check Kate it. Winslet. Well, well no not really uh evan rachel wood i think is in it i, I like her huh. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know, but I'll check it out. No, I'm not a big fan of Kate Winslet. That's a Titanic girl, right? Yeah. Yeah. I hated the Titanic. Yeah. Which when we, uh, talk about another movie, Titanic's going to come up again. Is it Titanic 2? No, it's not. Damn That's it. an asylum film. No, it's not. <laughs> I'm going to make a case for Titanic 2 as a film noir. At some point. I'll probably fall on my backside, but I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you could. That's the thing that I think that they haven't really explored with the Titanic is like, who cares about the actual ship sinking? Everybody knows about it. it. It was traumatic. It was crazy that it was the first launch, supposed to be the unsinkable ship. And it sinks on its first, you know, go around. But we all know that. It would be fun, however. What if there was a noir film set on the Titanic during that voyage? You know, I could see that. That would be fun. Um, Are you trying to pitch this right now? Maybe. Maybe I am. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, maybe that would be fun. And these people now, the boat's sinking. Whoever is, you know, our leads in this has to get off the ship and escape and be one of the survivors, right? Why not? That sounds like an intriguing, fun story. All on the backdrop of the Titanic sinking. You just don't want the cost of a ship sinking into the ocean. <laughs> we'll use a bathtub with a little toy boat. Props. <laughs> Be like Stingray where there's just a little boat that someone's holding. It's just a little choo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can do it. But there we go, folks. That's the next Kickstarter. <laughs> See you in six our, months. Yeah, help us fund our bathtub boat sinking scene. <laughs> oh man <clears throat> so what do you give this film what's your rating uh, do you know what I don't I think you might be surprised uh -oh. with my rating uh oh you had nothing I... bad to say about it except for it was a little too long I'm gonna give it 
and nine gins out of ten. Oh, shit. How do we agree again? That's yeah. exactly what I was going to give it. I'm going to give it and purely because um, I really, really like the theme of substituting money for love and how that doesn't fucking work. Uh-huh. Because I'm a really big... Uh, some people think I'm horrible because as a parent, I'm pretty harsh. I'm pretty, pretty mean. And that's because I want to teach my daughter the value of money. You know, if you, it doesn't grow on trees, you can't rely on it. You've got to think of other ways. And I'm very big on ways to be together as a family without spending money. Um, and I like to think that if I ever got some, I would be the same. However, I know that a lot of people will substitute money instead of that time and go, oh, you know, here's a 300 pound game, here's this, here's that. Instead of actually spending time, they'll just push them off onto some new technical thing and go, yeah, you just go and spend your time on there and leave me alone. And I think that this film is just a perfect example of how that doesn't work. So what you're saying is eventually somebody's going to make a sequel to Mildred Pierce that's going to be the opposite, and it's going to be called Carly Street. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. And then obviously, I will launch tours about how I'm a fabulous parent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's, that's a, you know, a perfect outlook there. Um, I also give it nine gens out of ten. That's impressive. Um, and you're again. Mean. I, again, you keep saying that. I'm starting to develop a complex. Um, yeah, I, I, my only issue, like I didn't have a problem with the length. Like usually I don't have a problem with the lengths of movies if they're a little longer. Um, but the the tonality difference with the murder and the rest of the movie is the one thing that sort of stuck out to me. Um, and again, both sections are done very well. It's just there's a noticeable shift in tonality between it. Um, and that was my only thing. Otherwise, it would have been a 10. Uh, but yeah. What did you think of Monty? Um, that's the new husband, right? Yeah. He was okay. I think it was a little, I don't know. It was all right. Both husband, like it, her first husband, I thought the actor, who I found out was also a gold medalist um, besides oh. acting. Interesting. Um, I think he, uh, what are you, um, shot put, I think it was. Or maybe Olympian. Maybe I, I made up the gold medalist part. I'd have to look back at that, but um, it stuck out. Um, but uh, the actor for Monty, I don't know. He, Well, anyway, the first husband, I just thought the actor was too stiff. Like, he was just very stiff. Um, so it was okay not seeing him very much. Um, but he just, he kind of reminded me of Mitchum's character when we talked about the big steel, oh, uh, okay. where Mitchum just felt really stiff. I mean, R yeah. Mitchum had more charisma, I guess. Maybe that's um, how he was playing it though. Cause I suppose it was, if he had a lot of charisma and he, you know, he was very charming and she wouldn't necessarily have kicked him out. That's true. I mean, that's very true. But even in the scenes like later on where he's just showing up to take the kids or you know, bring, bring the daughter back, you know, being a good guy and stuff like that. Even that was still like, he just felt very stiff. And I, I didn't check out to see how many films that he did before this. And he wasn't bad. It just was super stiff to me. Like, yeah, I think know. Monty was very much more, he had a lot of, like, he had a lot of, he had a lot of stuff about him. He was, he was very charismatic and you could understand how she was taken by him. Yeah. See, I didn't, I didn't get that. I mean, he he looked kind of like a weak Chen dude that just sort of like was a weasel. <laughs> he just seemed like a weasel to me. Like he had I understand, a good mustache. there was well, there was a good bit of facial hair there. Maybe I don't know. I just he just seemed so greasy, weaselly to me. Like I mean, it was it's it was painfully obvious this guy was just after money, um, you know, and was sort of trying to play the field and didn't really necessarily care about Mildred or anything really it was just money like he he grew up I, with money he, and that was fine because that's what I, his yeah, character I suppose was it was to nothing to him yeah it was yeah. it was everything to her um yeah and that, that was probably the worst decision she ever made because that just reinforced all the bad things about her daughter the thing that I didn't I, that I found a bit strange was when um her other daughter died and she oh. didn't tell him he just turned up to the restaurant like hey Let's dance with your uh, your daughter. Let me give you a little kiss. Where's your other daughter, Dad? Yeah, oh. 
I felt that whole sequence <laughs> a little strange. Like I felt like maybe there's like something cut out. Um, it did feel like there was a scene that was perhaps required where he tries to get in touch with her and she says, you know, bog off kind of thing. Something, something about, yeah, because I, I was sort of like, wait, oh, wait, what? Her daughter, her daughter's sick? Oh, she's died. Oh my gosh, she just died. What? And it just, it, that was, you know, but I mean, it, it didn't, it didn't hurt the film overall, you know, so it didn't bother me too much, but it, it felt like maybe there was something cut maybe for time or something. I'm, I'm not really sure what it was, but there was something strange about that scene to me. <clears throat> yeah. But great. So we both uh, gave it nine gens out of 10. Yeah, I like this one. It was a, it was a film where actually the women completely outranked the men. They were oh. both fantastic. Oh, yes. By far. Like, yeah. You know, the only one that could even compete was Wally, in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, <laughs> I, I got to bring this up because her accountant, I thought was hilarious. Um, he's only in like a couple scenes, but when um, I can't think of her name, but the person who first employed her as a waitress, and Ida. Then she, Ida, yeah, brought her on as, um, you know, basically managing the restaurants. There's this scene where the accountant is going over some stuff with Mildred. And Ida is left in the room and she does this little like her <laughs> thing to him. <laughs> and it just cracked me up so much. I thought it was hilarious. And I and thought, you see, even Ida I thought was fantastic. She's not really considered to be like a main role. She was mm. brilliant. Yeah. I thought she was, she was great. Really she was, she, she's like my spiritual animal. <laughs> I thought she was great. Yeah, she carried the role very well. And I was surprised that she, you know, this film was nominated for a lot of stuff, but I'm surprised that she, um, you know, didn't get more recognition for that. No. As as well as um um what was it, Blythe? And Blythe, I thought she uh I'm surprised she didn't win like a supporting Oscar. Yeah, or she she like that. yeah, she played it she played the character very well because to wanna smash her in the face every yeah. time she's on screen, you must be doing something well. Yeah. And I mean she still seemed pleasant and she still seemed like a decent girl, but then they would just, she would turn around and be like, haha, I faked a pregnancy for money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, Oopsie, married somebody and, you know, I'm like, extorted yeah. 10 grand out of them. Yeah. And we're talking like the 50s or like the tail end of the 50s or uh, tail end of the 40s. This was uh, 45. So we're still in the mid 40s here. But I'm like, is that something that happened back then? Like, I, you know, I mean, you hear about that kind of stuff but like man that would have to be like a big thing or maybe it wasn't maybe it, like well, maybe it wasn't because i mean like how do you prove that right do you know what i mean like now it'd be oh well show me this scan show me this then yeah maybe she that's would have been able to why. get away with that for ages yeah and then be like oops made a mistake yeah thanks for the 10 grand <laughs> yeah and the and the guy that she had married was still like, well, I don't see why we can't stay married. <laughs> like, oh, dude, bless run as fast as run. you can in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, she's gonna kill you. Man. Right. <laughs> and it's one of those times where you see his family, and you're like, yeah, the parents are on their shit because yeah. they're protecting their kid. They know there's something wrong here. You know what I mean? Most of the time, that depiction in movies is like the parents are sort of the bad people while the the kids go and elope and you know, have their fantasy life, you know, and in this one is like the parents were right on. I found so, it uh, interesting, though, that they were both single mothers. Uh, oh, were they? I didn't catch that. Well, I didn't see a dad anywhere. Like the court, like she went to see Mildred and say, hey, you can't be part of our family because you're a tramp. Uh huh. And then at the court proceedings, you would think at that time, the father would be the kind of like they had Wally who was kind of petitioning on their behalf, even though he's not a lawyer. Um, yeah. But it was just them two and their lawyer. And you would think that's a situation where the father would be kind of front and center. Oh, maybe I'm crazy. Cause I thought, I thought I saw another man in there. Maybe I'm... there was, there was her, him and their lawyer and Wally Mildred and the evil daughter. Huh? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. For some reason in my memory, I, I feel like there was another guy in there too. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe. I'm wrong. it came across to me like they were both kind of single parents. Yeah. And it might but, be because, I mean, if there was another guy in there, he certainly wasn't a big part of it. 
So you could be right. We'll just say you're right and, and wrong. Good. Just because I want you to be wrong. I'm glad. I'm glad we've established that. <laughs> All right. That is Mildred Pierce, a 1945 film directed by Michael Curtis. We hope you guys enjoyed us talking about it. Um, and we hope you enjoyed your uh, Jen Ricky uh, while listening to this podcast. Um, Carly, want to give them a preview of what we're going to do for the next episode, or should we keep it a secret? I still haven't decided if that's a thing we should do. I think we should maybe think just we should tell keep them. keep it a secret. See, we're on opposite ends here. I think we should tell them so that way they can watch the film and enjoy our assessment of it together. Okay. Well, but then you, you want to keep it. it a secret because why? Well, you know, we are giving away spoilers, so maybe it is better to let them know. To let them know? Yeah. I also want to keep it a secret in case we're completely wrong in what we're talking about. And it will take them longer to realize that we're talking nonsense. Oh, okay. So it's, like a self <laughs> it's like a self-preservation thing. Yeah, but eventually yeah. they'll catch up to us and stop listening to the show. We don't want that. <laughs> so yeah, but then we'll be right by then. <laughs> that will be right by then. <laughs> <laughs> I see your idea or your, your thought process there. All right. Well, I think, okay. So I don't know. Let's just tell them. Go on then. You go on then. You go on then. No, you the made this decision. You made this decision. The next so. one is your pick though. So you have to. Yeah, but I can't remember which one out of the two that I picked. Um... Hold on a second, and I'll be able to tell you. You can pick out the two that I picked. How about that? Uh-uh. It's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's the one with your buddy. Um, <gasps> Memento. Yep. Memento. Okay. So we're going to do a neo-noir next week. Uh, Memento, which launched some careers. Uh, Christopher Nolan, the director. And uh, I think Guy Pierce for the most part, right? I reckon done... so. Yeah, he hasn't done too much. Um, He's done before. loads. Well, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Guy Pierce, guys at home, ladies and gentlemen. But um, Carly loves him. I think maybe she hasn't seen Lockout or. Uh... Hey, I've seen that, okay? <laughs> Great. Or maybe The Time Machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll skim over that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has a blip. Eh, he's got more than a few. Or how about the uh, old man Waylon and Aliens? Ugh, God, that was terrible. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> but he's amazing. Like, I, he's amazing in LA Confidential. Like, that role was made for him. Um, I think he's he's fantastic in that film. All right, so yeah, next uh, next week we're going to be talking about the Neo Noir Memento, and uh, hopefully you guys have either seen it or you can, you know, watch it before then, and you know, uh, maybe give us a call, uh, let us know if uh, what we're talking about is a bunch of BS or we're right or wrong, or if you agree with us or not, and uh, you can give us a ring at eight one eight six four three one four four one, or you can find us uh, on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and hopefully leave us a review on uh, Apple Podcast or whatever your favorite service is. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye-bye. He's looking at you, kid. Thanks for joining us this week on the Speakeasy Noir Cast. Make sure to visit our website, resurrectionfilms.net, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes, or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, The Dark Side of Acting Up, available now on Amazon, or you can check out one of our films available on Amazon Prime.